lecture on the subject of geothermal energy and its place in the energy transmission, a very interesting technology. I'm David Ball, the chairman of the Power and Interest Division Northwest Centre, and I would like to thank you all for attending this lecture. It's been organised by the Power Industry Division and it is shared with the Greater Manchester area of the IMACE. The duration of the lecture will be about 40 minutes, followed with 15 minutes of questions. If you have any questions, will you please put them in the question box and Fatima Shabata will field them after the lecture. Will you all please squeeze up, switch off your microphones and cameras during the lecture? This lecture will describe the nature and the history of extracting energy that exists under our feet. It will also review some emerging close loop geothermal systems which hold great promise for the future. Geothermal systems can be placed almost anywhere in the world to provide energy with low GHG emissions and high capacity. The lecture will review the future projects and discuss how accurate these are likely to be. Our speaker today is John Clegg, who has over 30 years of experience gained in multiple countries in the sales and operation of oil and gas. He's a qualified engineer and an active member of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. John is involved in developing high temperature technologies that will be needed for emerging geothermal projects. Ladies and gentlemen, your speaker for today, Mr. John Clegg. Over to you, John. Thank you for the introduction and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is John Clegg. Um, as you'll hopefully see from the slide in front of you on the screen, uh, I'm currently Chief Technology Officer for a company called Hefe Energy Technology. Um, they, um, a lot of people ask about the name. Um, we were developing, or we intend to develop technology for drilling hot, deep geothermal wells. And we initially planned to call it Vulcan Energy Technology uh, after the Roman God. But we discovered that there were already about a thousand Vulcan energy companies out there, and we figured somebody would sue us if we used the name. But most of the Roman gods have got Greek equivalents, and Hephaestus is a close equivalent to Vulcan, so we shortened Hephaestus's name to Hephae, hence the uh, hence the name. Uh, I've been working in the upstream oil and gas industry since 1986, and much of that time has been involved in developing drilling technology. Uh, for the accurate placement of uh, oil and gas wells, including a lot of the unconventional oil and gas wells that have been very successful in uh, in North America. About three years ago, a couple of people independently suggested that I look at geothermal and I was somewhat sceptical because I always thought geothermal is a bit of a, a kind of a niche industry. It's It's for places like Iceland and New Zealand where there's a lot of volcanic activity. Um, but it's not really scalable. Um, but as I began to do some research, I realized that actually I might be wrong and it might actually be a lot more scalable. Um, and it was that research and the ability to potentially transfer technology from oil and gas that led a colleague and myself to set up uh, Hefe, uh, which is kind of jointly headquartered um, in Cheltenham in the UK where I am and in Houston, Texas, where my uh, business partner is. And I, it's a subject dear to my heart now, partly because um, I'm hoping to develop technology to grow the industry, and partly because I think the UK isn't talking about geothermal in the, with one or two notable exceptions uh, in Cornwall and uh, perhaps in Northern Ireland. The UK isn't really talking about geothermal energy in the same way as the rest of the world is. The UK government doesn't seem to have the same interest in it as certainly the Department of Energy in the US and maybe some of the European governments uh, do. So I think part of my mission is just to raise awareness of the potential of geothermal and why I think it has a, a very important place in future energy mix and in the energy transition. But 
we've been using geothermal energy for a long time. Um, I think human activity and the use of geothermal energy goes back about 10,000 years. And not very far from where I'm sitting today in Cheltenham is Bath Spa. And um, in Bath, there's about 2,000 year old technology which is still being used to uh, heat, um, heat the Roman baths. Um, illustrates maybe that heat isn't not necessarily just found in the those traditional geothermal locations like Iceland and New Zealand. Uh, I'm sorry, I seem to have a uh, timing issue. Uh, not necessarily used in those uh, traditional uh, locations, but can also be found underneath some of the most historic uh, towns and cities uh, it, that, that we have. But I'm interested in the use of geothermal energy to generate uh, electricity. And the first use of geothermal power to generate electricity uh, is less than 120 years ago, 1904, in a place called uh, Lardarello in uh, Italy. And today I'm going to be focusing on the hotter and deeper wells that are more likely to be used to the, for uh, power generation, less so on uh, things like uh, heating, because I think that the world has a big opportunity in using um, high temperature uh, deep formations uh, for uh, developing uh, creating electricity and power generation from geothermal energy. Like I said, I, I, I used to be skeptical about it. Uh, I used to think that uh, geothermal was only associated with tectonic activity and hot rocks in places like uh, Iceland, New Zealand, Indonesia, uh, parts of the Mediterranean like Italy. Um, this is the um, Gelding, uh, Gelding, Alde Gelding Aldea volcano, uh, which erupted in Iceland uh, a couple of years ago. And I used to think it was associated with uh, uh, places like this. And indeed, um, this is a geothermal power station in Iceland. And Iceland makes good use of its um, geothermal energy. And a power station like this uses steam, which comes from uh, reservoirs of hot water, which are tapped underground. And that steam is used to, to drive turbines to generate electricity in very much the same way as a coal-fired power station or a, uh, or a nuclear power station would. Uh, and I believe that in the future we're going to need a lot of electricity. Um, this is the um, IEA, the In International Energy Authority's uh, net zero uh, scenario. This is um, uh, the uh, energy vectors as of today, 2021. Um, and the yellow is um, um, basically uh, the, the uh, generation of uh, electricity. A lot of it comes from coal, some comes from nuclear, uh, quite a bit comes from natural gas, uh, as we, um, uh, you know, as, as we're aware from the prices we pay for electricity at the moment. Um, if you fast forward to 2050, uh, that electricity part of the vector has become a lot bigger. And in the IEA's net zero uh, scenario, electricity demand more than doubles between 2021 and 2050. And so we have to find either we have to burn a lot more coal and a lot more gas, or we have to find new ways of uh, generating electricity at scale. And it's in the generation of electricity at scale that I think uh, geothermal uh, begins to uh, come into play. Now, geothermal energy has a widespread of applications and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about what that spread of applications is and uh, kind of set the scene for what I'm going to be talking about as we go through the uh, the, the, the rest of the talk. Um, the simplest one, and probably the, the, the cheapest one to implement, uh, and a very important one, is direct use geothermal, where you can use heat from the ground, from just under the ground, uh, for both heating and cooling for residential and industrial applications. And temperatures not much higher than uh, a sort of um, room or atmospheric temperature, you know, sort of high 30s, 40 degrees Celsius is probably adequate for that. Hydrothermal energy is what I thought of a few years ago when people talked to me about geothermal energy. And it's what we saw in that power station in uh, Iceland a, a few slides back. And hydrothermal energy is drilling for water that uh, naturally occurs in uh, fractures in a formation uh, below the ground, uh, which is hot enough either to be multi-phase underground 
or to be able to uh, create steam as it uh, comes to the uh, surface and uh, drive a steam turbine to generate uh, electricity. In parts of the world, uh, it's quite successful. Um, it provided about 6% of California's energy in 2020. Of course, California is another one of those places which is tectonically uh, active. And um, in those locations, demand is growing faster than the capability, in my opinion, demand is growing faster than the capabilities of hydrothermal alone to provide uh, geothermal energy. So uh, I'm going to introduce a concept uh, of uh, unconventional geothermal systems and unconventional geothermal wells are wells which are drilled where there is no fluid or where there's not necessarily any fluid present in the formation. So rather than drilling into hot rocks which have got water in them, like hydrothermal, uh, these are drilling into hot, dry rocks. Um, there's a couple of ways of doing it. Um, enhanced geothermal systems, and I'll show you a, a, a picture in a minute, uh, require that you drill wells and artificially stimulate, or if you talk in the language of oil and gas, fracture the formation to create artificial fractures that uh, expose fluid to heat and therefore heat up the fluid. And advanced geothermal, geothermal systems don't require any stimulation or fracturing. You just draw multiple wells through the formation and you drill something like the reverse of a downhole radiator and uh, you uh, just take heat directly from the rock into uh, fluid in those wells. Both of them have got pros and cons. I'll talk about those a little bit as the uh, as the talk goes on. Um, this is a slightly more illustrative version of the slide that I just uh, described. Um, you can see here, um, ground loop stuff can work at fairly low temperatures uh, for uh, ground source heating and cooling. Um, hydrothermal systems will drill into uh, deep aquifers to get uh, um, sort of water from deep below the ground at relatively high temperatures. And uh, EGS and AGS systems will drill into deeper formations. It says here above 130 Celsius. I'll talk later about why higher temperature is e or even better. Uh, to get uh, energy from uh, deep under the ground. Now, that's the kind of how, and I'll come back to more details of the how later on, but I wanted to talk about why, because at the very beginning of the talk, I said that you know part of my mission is to uh, explain why I think the UK should be looking more closely at uh, geothermal. And uh, the first one is um, emissions, so greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, this is from uh, IRENA, another international organization. It's about five years old, uh, six years old now, but this is their estimate of life cycle uh, GHGs by source of power generation. And you can see non-renewable resources, which is um, basically uh, fossil fuel resources plus nuclear energy, um, have the fossil fuels have very high GHGs. Uh, nuclear has, um, you know, significant, but much lower GHGs. Then you get into things like wind, uh, tidal, um, hydro, and geothermal is here. Very, very low emissions compared with um, many of its uh, sort of compatriots. So if you want low carbon source, then geothermal uh, potentially ticks that box. But the other thing it does, which is unique in terms of uh, the, um, uh, the a source of renewable energy, this is a uh, study from Geothermal Canada from about five years ago. If you look at capacity, you look at things like wind and uh, solar and tidal, and um, they have relatively low capacity. And capacity is basically the amount of time that the energy source is up for. And it kind of makes sense, you know, wind turbines will only generate electricity when the wind blows and solar panels will only generate it when during, during the hours of daylight and, and so on. And so if you're going to use those as uh, sources of uh, energy, then either you need to have energy storage or you need to have another source of energy which is capable of uh, balancing the grid because you have to have something which has got very high capacity and which is also capable of being switched on or off um, as, as, you, uh, as you need it. Um, at the moment, gas fulfills that um, really well. 
I think nuclear perhaps not quite so much because it takes longer to uh, ramp uh, nuclear uh, energy up and down. But a geothermal well with uh, hot fluid flowing out of it, uh, the, the, the flow of fluid from the well could be choked down very, very quickly. And so it can be uh, used as the kind of balancing um, uh, source in a grid system. And the beauty of it is if you do choke down the flow of fluid from the well to turn down the uh, energy generation when you don't need power, uh, that fluid that's stuck in the well just gets hotter and hotter and hotter while it's down there. So you actually get uh, the, you, you don't lose the energy, you actually get more of it back as you um, as you open up the flow again. So um, it, it's kind of a unique combination of low greenhouse gas and high capacity and the absence of the need for uh, storage like batteries or uh, molten salt or various other more esoteric storage schemes <clears throat> that I think uh, makes uh, geothermal uh, a, a power source which is uh, which is worth looking at. The other thing is because we're talking with unconventional geothermal about drilling for um, heat and not drilling for fluid, you can draw pretty much anywhere. And what that means is that um, if you're developing a new industrial park or a new housing estate or you're building a new town or whatever, you can, uh, in theory at least, uh, drill a well adjacent to that industrial park or new town or housing or whatever and uh, generate the power um, pretty much uh, at source. Uh, and that overcomes uh, grid congestion, which I know has been an issue in, um, in I lived in Texas for a number of years. And uh, if you drive to North Texas, and particularly if you drive west from the Dallas-Fort Worth area out towards uh, Midland and then El Paso in the west, you drive past mile after mile after mile of these huge wind farms. And there's a tremendous amount of wind energy which is generated in Texas. But the place where the wind energy is generated and the place where the power is used, they're, they're different places. And you have to get all of the electrical power from the wind turbines to the cities which are distant. And you do get issues with grid congestion. There's, there's basically too much power for the uh, grid to handle, which means that you can't use the full capacity of your, uh, your generating uh, capability. The ability to place uh, geothermal power stations closer to the point of use um, is one ingredient or one tool that you can use, if you like, to overcome the uh, potential issues of grid congestion. Now, having established the fact that there are many good reasons for doing it, that the next thing to think about is um, economics. And based on the research I've done, the economics of geothermal are actually better than you might think. This slide is looking at uh, the levelized cost of energy uh, comparison uh, between a variety of different sources. This was done, uh, the reference is missing off this slide for some reason, but it, it was done by uh, Lazard a couple of years ago. And their estimates, uh, for example, for, and these are estimates uh, in dollars per megawatt hour, their estimates for uh, nuclear between 129 and 198 dollars, coal between 65 and 159, combined cycle gas between 44 and 73, which is uh, relatively low. Uh, wind and solar are in the 30s, um, but I don't think that includes storage. Geothermal, they estimated between basically between 60 and 100 dollars. So it's in the same ballpark as um, uh, the lower end of coal, cheaper than nuclear, uh, cheaper than peak gas costs, uh, according to this uh, study by Lazard. So uh, I think it has potential to come down more, but we're not starting from a, uh, a very high base. And studying the um, output from some of the unconventional geothermal companies, they seem to be aiming at about 50 uh, US dollars per uh, megawatt hour by the end of this decade, um, getting down from 65, 75 through 60, and then down to uh, 50, according to Fervo Energy, one of the new unconventional geothermal companies um, ever, which is probably the biggest one with the highest profile at the moment, um, uh, aiming for uh, $50. And more recently than that, 
just released by the uh, DOE in the US. They've launched this thing they call the Enhanced Geothermal Shot. It's a bit like a moonshot type project. And they want to uh, reduce the cost of um, unconventional geothermal, which is currently higher, uh, down to about $45 per megawatt hour by 2035. So all of those numbers, you know, $45, $50, they're all in about the, um, the, the, the same place. So we are hopeful, my company's hopeful, that we'll be able to contribute to the technologies required to be able to drill geothermal wells at scale. And scale, I'll show you in a slide in a few slides time, is one of the things which is going to help to uh, to, to bring that cost down. Um, there are interesting variation of growth projections for the geothermal industry. Um, working in oil and gas, I've always found Rystad, the Norwegian company, to be one of the most reliable in terms of forecasting where the market is going to go. This is their forecast of uh, the number of uh, geothermal wells drilled per year from, this was from 2021. We're now into 2023, and you can see what looks like remarkable growth. Um, but then when you look at the uh, the number of wells drilled, they're talking about going from about 200 wells per year to about 700 wells per year, which is not huge. Um, the reason why I think their um, estimate is to, so small, uh, for those of you that can read in the uh, the small print on the screen, um, they are estimating their unannounced projects is estimating the number of wells required to meet published government targets around the world. And published government targets isn't often the most dynamic way of driving a market. Uh, and it, we believe that uh, market forces are going to drive things uh, a little bit more rapidly. And we're going to get slightly more than um, 700 wells a year drilled uh, by the uh, by the end of the decade. Um, we've talked to individual unconventional geothermal companies uh, who are talking, each of them is talking about drilling a couple of thousand wells a year uh, by that time. And this next slide, this is a bit of a thought experiment, um, but um, the scale is potentially massive. And um, this is a company, a Northern Irish company called Causeway GT. And, and I don't think they intended these numbers to be taken seriously, but they were saying this is kind of what could happen. And um, their estimate, if you look here on the uh, the lower left, they're talking about two and a half million wells per year by uh, 2040. And you know, in, in order to meet um, potential demand for energy in the future, that doubling of the electricity uh, vector that I was talking about earlier, uh, will need some fairly radical solutions. And it is possible that uh, we could be talking about drilling maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of wells per year rather than hundreds of wells per year by uh, 2035 or, or 2040. And uh, that would still be only a relatively small industry compared with the number of, of wells that the oil and gas industry drills per year. So it, it's not beyond the realm of, uh, of possibility. Um, Looking at one country as an example, um, Italy, um, a company called NL in uh, Italy, which is a geothermal driller, um, estimates that that particular country has got resources between uh, 500 million and 10 billion tonnes of oil um, equivalent. So that's between six and 116,000 terawatt hours of energy compared with Italy's uh, energy requirements of just over 300 uh, terawatt hours per year. So Given that that energy is fairly close to the surface, especially in Italy, because the thermal gradient is quite high there, um, you only need to extract a fairly small amount of the geothermal energy present in Italy to meet all of its uh, annual energy requirements. So again, I, I think the potential for geothermal is much greater than uh, a lot of people imagine. Um, before we started the, uh, the, the meeting, we were having a a quick conversation about um, leveraging existing power stations. And um, there has actually been a study in a place called Colstrip, which I think is in Montana. Yeah, Montana in the US. And Colstrip is a um, is basically a to be retired coal fired power station. Um, very high, high polluter. Um, the uh, the single largest source of particulate uh, emissions in Montana. Um, 
issues with wastewater management, all sorts of problems. Uh, but the great thing about a an existing power station is it might have infrastructure that could be repurposed in terms of uh, you know turbines and uh, cooling towers and all the rest of it. I'm not enough of an expert on power generation, generation uh, more of an expert in drilling wells, but it's possible that that could be leveraged. But what could certainly be leveraged is the uh, infrastructure in terms of uh, high tension um, uh, grid. Uh, because there is a power grid which is already running to the location where that uh, coal-fired power station is about to be retired. So if they were to drill geothermal wells and replace the coal-fired power station with the geothermal power station, they'd be able to basically hook up to the existing uh, power lines, save a huge amount of capex and continue to use that um, asset, as well as providing continuing employment for the people in the town who are otherwise going to go without work and replacing a polluting uh, power source with a clean one. And um, one last comment about cost. Um, this is again from Lazard. This is 2020, it's three years old, looking at how the levelized cost of energy from wind and uh, solar declined over the course of a decade. And you can see they both have very dramatic decline curves, particularly solar. And a lot of this comes from scale. And uh, rather, if geothermal wells, instead of being drilled in ones and twos, were drilled in hundreds or thousands, uh, we see a very similar um, uh, sort of uh, cost curve decline. A very similar thing happened in oil and gas when unconventional wells started to be drilled in North America in uh, oil and gas, where instead of drilling bespoke wells to target particular geology to find particular sources of oil or gas, people start to do what's called factory drilling, which is drilling loads and loads of wells that look identical to each other, and they're artificially creating the reservoirs by fracking. Now, that, that in itself is controversial. Uh, we can maybe talk about that later. Um, but the point is not about the fracking, it's the drilling of the wells. Because the wells are all the same as each other, you learn how to drill them efficiently, and the cost of drilling them comes down dramatically. And if uh, we could factory drill geothermal wells, you could see the same kind of thing happening. Um, geothermal uh, can be deeper and uh, hotter than uh, oil and gas wells. This is a graph of uh, pressure versus temperature um, for uh, wells that have been drilled. Um, and you see oil and gas wells out here on the right, we drilled up to very high uh, temperatures, close to uh, 200 meg megapascals of reservoir pressure. But generally, not drilled much above 200 degrees Celsius. And um, that's partly because there's not really any drilling equipment that works above 200 degrees Celsius. Geothermal wells have been drilled quite a bit hotter. You see, uh, there's an example here at 450 degrees Celsius, but tend not to have the uh, same uh, pressure issues. You're not drilling into highly pressured uh, reservoirs. You're uh, drilling into lower pressure reservoirs, or in our case, just drilling for, uh, for heat. And all you need for um, unconventional geothermal wells is hot, dry rock. And so then what you need to think about is the uh, temperature gradient. And this is a map of the US because this is the most widely published data. This is uh, created by Southern Methodist University. Um, you see in parts of the west of the US, uh, the uh, temperature at seven and a half kilometers deep is up close to uh, 350 degrees Celsius. If you go down to uh, 10 kilometers, you could see there's large areas at 350 degrees. And uh, if you look at this belt across Texas and Louisiana, which is actually close to where a lot of oil and gas drilling is done at the moment, is in the uh, 200 Celsius uh, plus region. Um, a lot This opens up a lot of places to um, uh, the potential for drilling for, uh, for, for heat. Um, UK also has resources that could be uh, tapped into. Um, if you're looking at seven kilometres below the uh, surface of the UK, there are three notable areas that are uh, above 200 Celsius. Uh, one of them is uh, Devon and Cornwall um, underneath the moors. And in, indeed, there are currently geothermal wells being drilled uh, around the uh, Eden Project, for example, in Cornwall. Um, there is an area uh, kind of across uh, from the Lake District and eastwards, and also uh, part of Northern Ireland, where the uh, subsurface temperatures 
um, are um, particularly high. But if you uh, look above 120 Celsius, there's a large part of the UK where there are um, significant subsurface temperatures at seven kilometers deep. And according to the uh, Eden project, a number of areas where there is the uh, potential for geothermal energy to provide uh, electricity. In fact, Eden project uh, has estimated here that uh, a fifth of the UK's current energy demand could be met by geothermal energy. Um, Devon and Cornwall, as we just saw in the previous slide, could uh, provide the equivalent of uh, two nuclear power stations. The Lake District could provide one, Weirdale could provide one, and there are a number of areas where um, uh, heat could be uh, provided uh, as well. So definitely resources in the UK that can be tapped into. Heat is important. <clears throat> the deeper you go, the, uh, the the hotter you get. It's kind of an exponential relationship between uh, heat and um, energy production. So the deeper you go, the more electrical energy you can uh, generate. And uh, Baker Hughes estimated uh, that uh, three wells on a project at 400 Celsius would produce more power than 40 wells at uh, 200 Celsius. So what do these geothermal wells look like? Well, these are very simplified uh, images. Uh, an enhanced geothermal system, as I mentioned, you drill a couple of wells and then you produce uh, hydraulic fractures uh, between them. Um, and this is kind of shown on this cartoon. There's a well which has been drilled to deliver cold fluid to the formation. There are fractures that have been produced between these two wells. As the fluid flows through the fractures, it gets naturally heated by the rock. And then um, hot fluid comes back up to the uh, power station on the surface. Uh, there are pros and cons of uh, fracturing. It can produce a uh, large surface area for flow. Um, but um, if flow starts to go through a dominant fracture, it can start to wash out that fracture, um, reduce the amount of flow through other fractures, and eventually you get a short circuit where all the flow goes through one path. You don't get enough surface area, you don't get enough uh, heat from the formation, and then you have to go in and uh, remediate. And also uh, there is um, what's euphemistically called um, uh, seismic activity, uh, which could be caused by um, uh, hydraulic fracturing. And that has been an issue with geothermal wells as well as with oil and gas wells. Advanced geothermal systems, and there's a few different examples here, uh, don't require fracturing and they produce their own uh, loops. So you can drill wells as a Canadian company called Ever, which is talking about drilling wells like this image on the left, which is like a big complex downhole radiator where fluid will flow down one of these through this what looks like a maze and around a loop and then back up to the surface. And know that those look like very complex wells to drill, but the oil and gas industry knows how to drill wells that would look like this. There's nothing in terms of the ability to drill directionally, which the which would be a problem for current oil and gas technology, apart from temperature. Uh, you can have a U-shaped well where you pump fluid down one leg and it comes back up the other leg. And there are people developing coaxial systems where you pump cold fluid down the center through insulated pipe, and then it comes back, it's warmed up on its, uh, on its return journey. Lots and lots of different potential ways of doing it. As with any new technology, uh, in the future, we'll look back and we'll see that one or two systems have uh, prevailed. Whichever one does prevail is likely to need either directional or horizontal drilling. And uh, horizontal wells uh, have been drilled very successfully in uh, oil and gas. Uh, in oil and gas, they're drilled so that you maximize the exposure of the well to a particular uh, formation which bears hydrocarbons. In geothermal world, they would probably be drilled in order to drill along an isotherm. So you figure out what temperature you want to expose the uh, fluid to, and you drill a well which has got as much exposure to that temperature as possible, which is generally going to mean drilling down to a depth and then drilling horizontally. And uh, horizontal wells have got a lot longer, a lot cheaper in the oil and gas industry, and as I mentioned earlier, productivity and unconventional wells in the US has um, improved uh, significantly. Now, there is an issue uh, which I will talk through quickly called thermal decline. Uh, this was demonstrated in a, um, an experiment back in the 1980s uh, in Cornwall, uh, whereby the problem with 
rock is it's got very low thermal conductivity. And it's good that it's got low thermal conductivity because if it didn't, we'd all burn our feet when we went outside for a walk. Um, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't allow heat to flow rapidly. What that means is that if you drill a well through it, and this is um, this image is supposed to show a well in the center and fluid is flowing through this well. And then there are concentric rings of increasing heat um, through which uh, increasing temperature through which heat has to flow to get to the uh, fluid which is flowing through this well in the center. The, the, the well's flowing into the screen, if you like. As the heat gets closer and closer to the uh, well, not only is it flowing through uh, rock which is poor thermal conductivity, but also the cross-sectional area it's flowing through is getting smaller and smaller. So it's almost like a thermal choke. And that means that it might be difficult to um, produce consistently from a single well which is why at least one company, and this is a company called Icarus, uh, has demonstrated that in order to maintain steady production, you'll need multiple wells and you would switch production between them. So you might produce from this well in the center. And as you produce from the well, well in the center, it cools down the uh, formation around it. And so after a while, you'd stop producing from that well and you'd start producing from maybe this one at the bottom uh, and allow the one in the center to heat up. And then you go to the one at the top and so on. So you you have multiple horizontal legs and you switch between them. It's quite likely that that's what um, wells of the future will look like. Um, this is the same company as an image from their website uh, showing that they're producing from this red well while the two blue ones are uh, cooling up and they'll just uh, <clears throat> start to switch between them. So you finish up with something that looks a bit like oil and gas wells. These are these are unconventional oil and gas wells uh, in the US. You have a small number of surface locations. You drill down and then you drill out horizontally. Uh, you could imagine the same kind of thing happening with any of those geothermal uh, designs that we uh, that, that we looked at uh, earlier. And um, I kind of look at this from an oil and gas perspective because that's my background. And one of the messages that I like to get across when I do this presentation is that oil and gas companies who choose to position themselves in terms of uh, as, as leaders in high pressure, high temperature drilling are likely to uh, own the future of uh, energy in terms of uh, geothermal. And part of the message I try and get into my industry, oil and gas, is this is a very adjacent industry and involves a lot of the same skills in terms of drilling, reservoir measurement and um, and so on. And uh, so it's a good thing to get into. <clears throat> and something I try and tell potential investors in my company is um, what Larry Fink was saying in his um, letter to CEOs at the beginning of last year, which is that the new unicorns won't necessarily be search engine, social media, tech companies, but they will be uh, startups that help to uh, decarbonize and help to uh, grow the energy transition. So I, I think the energy transition has the potential to attract a lot of investment and to produce a lot of uh, employment in technology development and uh, deployment. But and I'll kind of go back to the message um, from the beginning of the presentation. For the UK to participate in that, I think the UK has to become more interested in geothermal than it is at the moment and has to match the aspirations of the uh, European countries and particularly the United States in terms of seeing the potential of this. Um, this uh, uh, Eric Van Oort is uh, a professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the US. Um, and he thinks that ge deep geothermal is about where wind and solar were 20 years ago. And that's kind of echoed in the graphs I showed you earlier, looking at the, uh, the decline curve for the cost of wind and solar and how Geothermal might track that. And so again, it, it's a compelling case for investment. <laughs> now, my particular um, involvement in this is developing drilling and then possibly equipment for completions and production for maintenance of wells. So things like sensors downhole to tell you how hot the uh, well is, what kind of condition it's in, how well it's flowing and, uh, and so on. Um, Oil and gas technology doesn't really go above 200 Celsius uh, for drilling. We're trying to develop technologies initially around 210 Celsius, moving to 225 and then to 300 and possibly beyond. 
as we draw deeper and deeper to get into higher and higher temperatures. Um, we don't have to do it all by ourselves. We do have help from adjacent industries. Uh, aerospace is looking increasingly at temperatures closer to um, 225 Celsius. There's a number of reasons why aerospace is looking at higher temperature um, sensors and electronics. Uh, getting sensors closer to the um, action in gas turbine engines is one example. Um, unfortunately, hypersonic missiles is probably another example where there's a lot of work going into uh, high temperature uh, controls at the moment. And um, we've even talked to um, uh, the people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and they're developing uh, electronics for the uh, Venus rover. And the Venus rover probably won't be quite as long lived as the Mars rover because Venus is a little bit less hospitable than Mars. But their target is for, uh, I think, 480 Celsius operation for 500 hours. Uh, in uh, This is an artist's impression of the surface of Venus, but in uh, what could be a very, very hostile environment. So we do have help from uh, other industries. There's a, uh, a guy called Stephen Johnson wrote a great book, Where Good Ideas Come From, in 2010. And he talked about what he called the concept of the adjacent possible and what he meant by that. It, there's, there's always a new layer of invention and discovery that society is about to peel back. And new technologies become possible as those layers of the onion, if you like, are, um, are, are peeled back. Um, and if each layer contains scientific discovery, any technology that relies on that scientific discovery becomes feasible as soon as that layer's contents emerge. And we believe that uh, recent developments, both in high temperature electronics and also in materials, uh, have made uh, higher temperature um, equipment for wells feasible in a way that it wasn't maybe five or uh, ten years ago. Uh, and so what that means is that uh, while what we're trying to do with uh, drilling these hot wells might have been ahead of its time a few years ago, not so much now. And I, I think its time might have come. If you want to know more, um, here's a selection of companies that are uh, involved in um, unconventional um, uh, or sometimes one or two conventional geothermal energy. The companies on the right hand side of the slide that are uh, slightly uh, more emphasized uh, companies that are based in the UK. So there are people here that are doing it, which is great and uh, really good to see. Hopefully there'll be more soon. Um, check out companies like these if you're uh, more interested and also uh, look at what the some of the oil and gas majors are starting to get into geothermal in a way that's more than just greenwashing. I think they're genuinely looking at ways of um, developing geothermal as part of their portfolios because they see uh, potential in it for the uh, for the future. Uh, these trade bodies um, are um, all looking at uh, geothermal energy, uh, geothermal rising, uh, geo at the University of Texas and the Society of Petroleum Engineers. They're probably all doing more than IMEC is at the moment in terms of uh, looking at geothermal. And so maybe we should be looking at what these guys are doing and uh, think a bit more about whether we can contribute to a uh, potential uh, clean uh, base load and uh, relatively um, sort of um, what's what I'm looking for, plentiful. I was going to say infinite, but certainly plentiful source of energy for the UK um, in years to come. With that, um, I will say thank you for your uh, attention. Um, if you check out the, the the paper at the bottom of the uh, screen was written by myself and my business partner a couple of years ago and uh, has a bit more information about what we think about um, geothermal energy. Um, I'm happy now to take questions. Uh, there is a caveat. Um, I'm an expert in drilling wells and well construction. I'm not an expert in uh, power generation on the surface, and so I'll probably be able to answer some questions more easily than I can uh, others, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best. So thanks for your attention. I'll uh, end the show and uh, I will turn it over for uh, questions. Thank you very much, John. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, so Sally is asking, what is the design life of a geothermal well? Has the maintenance replacement the commissioning uh, of the well when they are used uh, is no longer required costs being uh, factored in the cost. Have the costs of all the relevant permits been costed into? It's a really good question uh, and it, it gets to the root of what one of the challenges might be in terms of uh, funding um, and uh, investing in geothermal. 
we um and i'll answer it in a kind of roundabout way because there's a bit more information i can i can add in myself and my business partner we, we did a uh, a kind of thought experiment on how much energy you could actually get out of a well and um an unconventional horizontal well in the US cost between five and eight million dollars to drill just just for the well. That's in addition to any anything that goes on the surface. And produces and I can't remember what the number is, but it produces a certain number of terawatt hours of uh, or gigawatt hours of electricity. Sorry, of, of energy, which you could turn it into electricity if you want. You could put it in your car and run your car if you want. You can run aeroplanes on it, whatever, because it's a very portable vector. Uh, we estimated that to get the same amount of energy from a geothermal well uh, producing eight megawatts would take 16 years. Um, but there's no reason why with a small amount of remediation and work over a geothermal well might not be able to produce uh, power for 50 years or even more. Um, the reason why geothermal wells decline in uh, conventional applications in places like California and I think this is becoming an issue at the moment in some parts of the world, is that the water uh, doesn't get replenished because maybe the rainfall isn't there in the way that it used to be. So if rainfall patterns change, you require rainfall to go, goes down through uh, fissures in the formation. Uh, it eventually uh, reaches the uh, reservoir, then it gets heated up, you drill, you get hot water, it turns into steam, you generate power. If it stops raining, then you eventually run out of water. And uh, Unconventional wells aren't subject to that because you provide your own fluid from the surface. You pump it round. <clears throat> In fact, you may not even need to pump it round because uh, convection is going to help to uh, make it flow around to an extent. And that could be water. Could actually be liquid CO2 because um, CO2, uh, I think, uh, has a lower supercritical temperature than water. So CO2 could be quite a good medium and it'd be great use for CO2 as well, um, kind of ironically. Um, but a geothermal well might last for 50 years, it might last for longer. Um, one of the challenges is that people tend to like to invest in things that uh, pay back quickly. There's not a lot of people around who want to invest their savings in something that's going to give them their money back in 100 years for fairly obvious reasons. You know, not, none of us is going to live that long. Um, but there may be a place for, for governments, uh, for things like um, pension schemes who have to have a longer term view. So you might have to choose the right kind of investor. There are philanthropic investors who want to invest in this at the moment. Um, there are many and they do great work. Um, but uh, mainstream, I think you need to change your view slightly of how quickly investments pay back because these may pay back more slowly, but for much longer. And so if you amortize it over a long enough period, it could be a, a very good financial bet, but you need to take a different view of um, of, of investing. Uh, but the wells themselves, once they're drilled, they'll require a modest amount of, um, of, of attention in terms of remediation and uh, and maintenance, but they, they should last for quite a while. Uh, in terms of um, how long the power stations will last, there's probably uh, 50 people on this call who are more qualified than I am to uh, to answer that question. Thank you very much. Um... So Bass is asking, uh, can you match the potential developments of uh, geothermal with concerns about uh, seismically active zones? Um, yeah. Um, let me think how to best answer that question. I'm trying to figure out what the <clears throat> what the primary concern is there. Is it about uh, seismically active zones damaging the um, the geothermal wells? Or is it about induced seismicity? So, um, hmm. I, in terms of induced seismicity, um, there are potentially issues if you fracture the formation. But if you drill AGS wells, closed loop wells, the, there should be no concerns about inducing uh, seismicity. Um, in terms of um, seismically active zones, I mean, you probably want to avoid drilling across faults uh, and very close to faults. Um, I guess there is a potential for a well and the, the investment to be damaged uh, if there are significant seismic events like earthquakes uh, very close to the, uh, the the surface location. Um, but I, I, 
not an expert on seismicity, but I would imagine judicious uh, understanding and uh, a placement um, would resolve that. And if wells are damaged, they to an extent they can always be redrilled. Uh, you, you, you know, if, if if you spend maybe five million dollars on a well and five million dollars on a power station, and uh, there's some kind of event that damages part of the well, you can you can go in and you can rework the well. You can perhaps redrill part of it. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and uh, Doug is asking: uh, many parts of the world are having more and more difficulty sourcing fresh water. How much impact will this have on geothermal plants? You don't necessarily need to use uh, water as the um, as a fluid. Um, if you have a closed loop which is sealed, particularly if it's sealed from the formation, um, there are fluids. Actually, even if it's not sealed from formation, there are fluids other than water that you can use. I mentioned liquid CO two is one of them. And in fact, if you have uh, an EGS well which has got fractures where the fluid actually flows through the formation. Um, water isn't necessarily the best uh, medium to use because of the uh, potential for dissolving salts that are present in the formation and then uh, carrying those into the um, uh, into the fluid. The, in conventional geothermal wells, there are quite a lot of nasty things that can be co-produced with the uh, with with the hot water, including things like uh, hydrochloric acid, uh, H2S, and, uh, and and so on. Um, and there is a possibility of dissolving salts uh, as you drill. Now, that's good and bad. Uh, I think in Cornwall they're uh, co-producing lithium salts with the uh, the, the water as they uh, produce geothermal energy, and lithium is quite a good uh, secondary source of uh, revenue. I know there are other parts of the world where that's uh, being looked at as well. Um, but generally, you don't necessarily have to use uh, water, and you could turn it on its head and say if you can produce large amounts of um, uh, certainly in coastal areas where um, there's uh, problems with fresh water. I'm thinking about uh, countries around the, uh, the Gulf of Arabia and the Red Sea, um, and particularly at the, the northwest of Saudi Arabia and that part of the Red Sea, uh, the thermal gradient is quite high. I think they're looking at uh, geothermal energy as a solution for NEON, the new city they're building there. Um, there is a possibility for using clean, uh, high capacity, high availability geothermal energy um, in desalination, because desalination is very energy intensive. But if you have a large supply of uh, of clean energy, then you can actually create fresh water. So it, it could be a, a source rather than a sink if you look at it the right way. Thank you very much. And one more question. Um, how would you suggest the students and young researchers to invest in researching about geothermal energy? Is there any area that the research can help uh, have further development in it? Um, I would um, look at um, look at what the the um, that I'll, I'll provide a copy of the uh, slides to you afterwards. So I mean, feel free to distribute those. And also, I think there's going to be a YouTube recording, so you'll be able to get back to the slide that had. Look at the companies that are involved in um, geothermal energy. The, uh, the the companies that I named on the slide. Um, look at the uh, societies. Um, the IMAKE has published quite a bit of stuff on geothermal, not as much as the others, but there is some. And also look at um, there are universities um, in the UK. Um, I mentioned Strathclyde as one who's done quite a bit of work on renewable energy and uh, has an interest in uh, geothermal energy. And um, also um, feel free to contact me and I can put you in touch with uh, potentially put you in touch with people. But uh, look at what those various companies are doing and see if it's anything that they're doing that uh, that, that you find interesting. And um, it's um, my experience in oil and gas was very, very exciting. I mean, that I didn't talk in, really in any detail at all about the drilling systems that I was developing and that my company is going to be developing. But they're really like robots that live um, a few miles underground and can measure where they are, decide which direction they need to drill in and then determine the direction that they uh, that they need to go in. So building robots that work under very high pressures and temperatures uh, miles away from the surface is actually it's really hard, but it's also a lot of fun. Um, a great career to get into, and if that can be redeployed and repurposed for producing clean energy, uh, all, all the better. So 
it's um, potentially a very exciting uh, career. And uh, yeah, I'd certainly, if, if you're looking at potential careers in energy, I, I think this is one area that I'd encourage you to look at. The more people that are interested in it, the more momentum uh, it, it, it's going to get. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, back to you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I think I'm back online again. Yeah. Well, thank you, John, for delivering a very, very excellent lecture. Um, it was uh, it was good from our point of view because it was a follow up on a lecture that we had a few years ago, and uh, we've now got uh, more knowledge. I was pleased to hear about the further progress with the closed loop systems because at the previous lecture it was just referred to, but now you've shown more about it and what it's all about, and I'm understanding is a little bit better than I did. So that was pretty good. I'm also particularly, I was particularly interested in your comment about the real potential of geothermal energy, which is quite enormous from what you indicated. So that's great. So thank you very much for that. Um, can we thank John in our usual way, even though you won't hear anything, can we give <laughs> him a big round of applause? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's uh, that, you. that's uh, You will re receive a little gift, which is a working model of a Stirling engine. You will find it quite fascinated, uh, fascinating, and it will come through the post. Fatima will be to sending it you. to you, so you should uh, enjoy that. And I'm sure your family will enjoy it. It's a it's a quite an intriguing little thing. So that just about uh, covers everything for tonight with apart from um our next lecture will be on the 14th of march and it will be on the subject of developing the uk's first hydrogen electric dual energy truck so that should be an an interesting and very topical subject so that really is all i have to say and there's anything more you want to say john no, I'm finished. I want to thank everybody for your time and uh, for your attention and for the opportunity to. Uh, I, I don't like to kind of be an evangelist, but I, I do think there's a lot more potential for geothermal than it's given credit for, mainly because of the capacity yep. and the, yeah, the ability uh, to balance the grid. And I would agree. So with any you opportunity right. to tell people about it is very welcome. So thank you for that. Right. So that's fantastic. So I think that just about draws us to a close. I don't think I've got anything else. So thank you all for attending. Enjoy the remainder of your evening and please come along to the next lecture. Thank you. And I'll drop you a line, John, just to thank you formally for today. Thank, so thank you, you very much and bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah, bye.